I've been asked time and time again to do some lessons on group theory, and today we're finally getting into it. We'll be going over the definition of a group, and we will see some examples. It'll be a lot of fun. We're going to begin by taking a quick look at the first half of the definition of a group to give us some idea what we're talking about. And then before digging into the details of the second half of the definition, we'll take a quick look at an actual example of a group. I think that'll help us get a good grasp of the concept without ever getting our heads too stuck in abstraction. So let's start. A group is a set G together with a binary operation just generically represented by a dot satisfying the following conditions. The following four conditions are often called the group axioms. So that's it. When we're talking about a group, what we're talking about is a set which is an unordered collection of distinct objects and some binary operation acting on that set that follows four rules. This is a type of algebraic structure, and groups are a very common one, which is why studying them is very useful and important. Now, even though the set and the binary operation together form the group, we'll often refer to the group by the name of the underlying set. So if the set is G, we'll often call the group G as well. And a binary operation, at the most basic level, is just a function that takes in two objects and spits out some third object. For example, addition is a binary operation. We could take two and three, put them into the binary operation of addition, and we get five out. So nothing too crazy going on here. Let's take a look at an actual example of a group, and we'll identify the group axioms when we look at this example. Consider the set of integers, often represented with a z like that. This is the set containing the numbers like negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and so on, forever in the positive and negative directions. Remember, a group just consists of a set and some binary operation on the set that follows the group axioms. So here is our set for our operation. Let's go ahead and try addition. So we're looking at the binary operation of addition acting on the integers. This is all very familiar territory. The first thing I want you to notice is if we take any two integers, like say negative 3 and 4, and add them together, we get another integer. So 1, in this case, for example, is an element of the integers. And this will be true no matter which two integers we add together. This is called the property of closure. The integers are closed under the operation of addition. Because any two elements of the integers that we take and add together, they stay within the set of integers. Satisfying closure is the first group axiom. The next thing I want you to notice, suppose we have three integers, like negative 3, 2, and 4. And suppose we're adding these integers together. We could, if we wanted to, put 2 and 4 in parentheses, so they are added together first. In which case, we'd have 2 plus 4, which is 6, plus negative 3, which is equal to positive 3. And as it turns out, this is the same thing we would have got if we had put negative 3 and 2 in parentheses instead. If we added negative 3 and 2 together first and then added 4, what would we get? Negative 3 plus 2, which is negative 1, plus 4, which is again positive 3. And this is true for any three integers. This is called the property of associativity. So we say that the integers are associative under the operation of addition. This is the second group axiom. Next, I've got a question for you. Is there any element of the integers that, when added to any other element, leaves it unchanged? If that question is a little unclear, what I'm talking about is zero. If we add 0 to 7, for example, the order doesn't matter. We could write 0 plus 7 or 7 plus 0. Either way, 0 being added to 7 leaves 7 unchanged. We just get 7. And this is the case for any integer. If you add 0 to it, it doesn't change. Thus, 0 is called the identity of the integers under addition, or simply the additive identity because zero preserves the identity of any element that it's added to. It doesn't change it. The existence of an identity is the third group axiom. And here's one more question for you. Given any integer, for example, 5, can you give me some other integer that when added to 5 will produce the identity, zero? 
And of course you can. You would tell me to just add the opposite, or the negative, of whatever number I start with. So for example, 5 plus negative 5 will give me the identity 0. So negative 5 is called the additive inverse of positive 5. Similarly, 5 is the additive inverse of negative 5. And again, that's because adding them together gives us the identity element 0. And an inverse, of course, exists for every integer. The inverse of negative 3, well, that would be positive 3. Add them together, you get 0. What about 2? Add it to negative 2, you get 0, and so on. Every element has an additive inverse. The existence of inverses is the fourth group axiom. So if we have a set alongside a binary operation, and together they satisfy closure, associativity, there's an identity element, and all the elements have inverses, then it is a group. So this is a group, the integers under addition. And if we wanted to, we might call the group G, and say that it's the ordered pair consisting of our set, the integers, alongside the binary operation addition. And notice that although addition is commutative, the order in which we add things doesn't matter. Commutativity is not a group axiom. So in general, the binary operation of a group may or may not be commutative. Now quickly, before we revisit the second half of the definition, let's see some contrast to these group axioms. For example, imagine instead of addition, we had considered division. This is not going to give us a group with the integers. Because, for example, what if we divide 1 by 2? Well, that's equal to 1 half, or 0 0.5. That's not an integer. So the integers are not closed under division. Also, 0 is an integer. So what if we take an integer like 3 and divide it by 0? Well, that is undefined. So that's a pretty big problem as well. Now, what if instead of changing the operation, we changed the set? For example, suppose we just consider the set containing negative 2, negative 1, 1, and 2. Clearly, this will pose several problems. For example, 2 plus 1 is equal to 3, which is not in our set. And since our set is no longer the set of integers, let me just cross out that z to avoid any confusion. We also don't have an identity element in this set. 0 is not an element of the set, so we've got no identity. And if we've got no identity, we don't really even have a definition of inverse. Because the inverse of an element is the element that we can combine it with in order to produce the identity. If we have no identity, we've got no inverses either. So those are just some counterexamples of things that aren't groups for contrast. Now let's quickly look back at the abstract statements of the group axioms. Again, beginning with the axiom of closure, which says for any elements in our set, they should combine to form an element also in our set. If A and B are in the set, then A times B should be in the set. And I'll point out my language here. This is just an abstract operation. We don't know what it is, but we'll often pronounce it as times, the same way we would if it was multiplication. Then we have associativity, which tells us for any three elements, A, B, and C, in our set, it should not matter how we bracket the elements when we combine them. A times B times C should be the same as A times B times C. An easy example of an operation that is not associative would be subtraction. 2 minus 3 is negative 1, minus 4 is negative 5, which is not equal to 2 minus 3 minus 4, since this is equal to 3. Then, of course, we've got the existence of an identity as the third group axiom. There should exist an element in the set, often called E, such that any element combined with E, in any order, is left unchanged. Lastly, we have the existence of inverses. For every element A in the set, there must be some element B in the set, such that combining A with B in any order produces the identity E. So if a set G with a binary operation satisfy these axioms of closure, associativity, the existence of an identity, and inverses, then it is a group. We'll want to pin these axioms right to the top of our brain because we'll use them a lot as we continue to study group theory. And so, of course, if we are given a set together with a binary operation, if we want to prove that it's a group, we just have to prove that it satisfies these four axioms. If it does, it's a group. 
And what's so powerful about these ideas is that it allows us to make statements about and prove theorems about groups in general, instead of having to individually investigate all sets and operations that behave in these ways. So the group is a very basic, useful, and common algebraic structure. Now we could stop the lesson here. We've gone over the definition, we've seen an example, we've seen some non-examples, but it wouldn't be a group theory lesson introducing groups without one more example. I think all of the notation and language at first when we start talking about groups, it can seem a little intimidating and kind of frustratingly abstract. But what if we could create a group with just a square. That might be a little easier to wrap our heads around. And of course, I wouldn't bring it up unless we could do it. Okay, so if we're going to create a group with a square, what should our underlying set be? Because remember, a group consists of a set with a binary operation that follows the group axioms. So what's this set going to be? Well, a square might be just a square, but a square has many symmetries. For example, if we rotate a square 90 degrees, it's as if we didn't move it at all. So that is a rotational symmetry of the square. But if we want to capture the fact that we have rotated the square, we could do that by labeling the vertices, say 1, 2, 3, and 4. Then if we rotate the square 90 degrees clockwise, the vertices will be in these positions, 1, 2, 3, 4, like that. And hopefully you can see that if we were to rotate it 90 degrees, those are the vertex positions we would have. And we could give a name to this square that has been rotated 90 degrees clockwise. We could call it R1. But squares have more than just rotational symmetry. For example, we could also reflect this square along this vertical axis of symmetry. And if we were to reflect our square along that axis of symmetry, 1 and 2 would flip places, so that would be 2 and 1, and 4 and 3 would flip places as well. So we'd have 3 there and 4 there. And let me just change those vertex labels back to their original color. So that's what we get when we reflect or flip the square along the vertical axis. We could call that FV for a vertical axis flip. Then the group that we build up with this square will consist of its symmetries, both rotational symmetries and reflective symmetries of the square. But we also need a binary operation, so what would our binary operation be? Well, our binary operation could be combining the symmetrical motions together. For example, we could combine a 90 degree rotation clockwise, R1, with a flip across the vertical axis, FV. And notice that this is really a composition of functions that are acting on the original square, so they should be performed from right to left. So what would we get if we combined these two symmetries? Well, since we have to go from right to left, First, we would just have a flip across the vertical axis, so we would just have this square here. Let's copy and paste it and bring these down a little bit. Then, once we complete that flip across the vertical axis, we have a 90 degree clockwise rotation, R1. And hopefully you can see how that's going to go. 2 is going to go to the position of 1, 1 to 4, 4 to 3, and so on. And this is our final product. This is the combination of a 90 degree clockwise rotation with a flip across the vertical axis. And you might be thinking, okay, that's pretty cool, but how does this fall in line with the property of closure? Well, of course, we haven't written out all of the elements in our set yet. We'll take a look at that in just a minute. But as it turns out, this symmetry of the square we created by combining a rotation and a flip is actually the same thing we would have got if we had flipped the square across this counter diagonal axis. If we flipped the square across this axis, 2 and 4 would stay in the same place as we see here, but 1 and 3 would switch places. And so as it turns out, combining a 90 degree clockwise rotation, R1, with the flip across the vertical axis, FV, is the same as a flip across the counter diagonal axis, which we could call F. C. And this will be true for all of our symmetries. If we combine them together, we'll get the result of another single symmetry. I encourage you to take a minute and write out all the symmetries of a square from rotations and flips. There's only eight of them, so it won't take too long. Hopefully you've done that. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the set of our square symmetries. And here they are in all their glory. We've got a zero degree clockwise rotation, which will of course be the identity of this group, which is why I've called it E. 
Combining a zero-degree rotation with any other element of our set will leave the element unchanged. Then we've got a 90-degree clockwise rotation, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees. And they are called R1, R2, and R3. Then we have a flip across the vertical axis, FV, a flip across the horizontal axis, FH, a flip across the diagonal axis, FD, and a flip across the counter-diagonal axis, FC. We won't go over justifying in detail that this does form a group, but I assure you it does, and you can check yourself. We already mentioned that, of course, a zero-degree rotation will be the identity element. What about inverses? Well, as it turns out, every flip will actually be its own inverse. If we follow a flip across the vertical axis with another flip across the vertical axis, the square will appear unchanged. And same thing for these other flips. And of course, the rotations have their own inverses as well. A 90 degree rotation, for example, followed by a 270 degree rotation, is a full 360 degree rotation, which looks like a zero degree rotation, our identity element. Now, what you could do if you had the time to take a closer look at how this group is working is to write out a table showing how all of the different symmetries combine. For example, what do we get when we combine a 90 degree clockwise rotation with a flip across the diagonal axis? You could make such a table for any finite group, and it's called a Cayley table. I've gone ahead and made a table for this group right here. So this table shows us what we get for all the combinations of symmetries of our square. This type of group we've created from the symmetries of a regular polygon is called a dihedral group. And in fact, we can create such groups for any regular polygon, which is pretty sweet. We could verify that these symmetries do indeed form a group by looking at this table, but I'll just point out a couple things. We see E, the zero degree clockwise rotation, is clearly our identity element. It leaves everything unchanged. We can also see that every element has an inverse. For example, if we combine R2 with itself, we get the identity E. So R2, a 180 degree clockwise rotation, is its own inverse. Quickly, I'll point out how to read this table. We could look at the element we get when we combine R3 with FV. And we see that it is FD, a flip across the diagonal axis. So that means R3 composed with FV is equal to FD. And remember, our function composition goes from right to left. So this means if we flip a square across the vertical axis and then rotate it 270 degrees clockwise, it will be as if we had flipped it across the diagonal axis. And we do not get the same result if we perform these operations in the other order. We can see that the flip across the vertical axis combined with R3, well, that gives us FC, a flip across the counter diagonal axis. So clearly, this is a non-commutative group. You could play around with some squares yourself to verify the entries in this table, but I'd recommend taking a look at the dihedral group for a triangle instead. Try making the Cayley table for the symmetries of a triangle. Notice that this dihedral group of a square, it is called D8, because a square has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 symmetries. For the same reason, the notation for the dihedral group of a triangle is called D6, because the triangle has six symmetries. In future lessons, we'll talk more about special types of groups, different relations that groups can have with each other, and a bunch of other cool stuff. But I hope this lesson helped you understand the definition of a group. That is a very good start. Remember that a group is a set G together with a binary operation, often represented with a dot or a star, that together satisfy the following conditions called the group axioms. The set must be closed under the operation, it must be associative under the operation, it must have an identity element under the operation, and every element must have an inverse under the operation. And that's what makes a group. So let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time, and be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet.